Well, welcome back to the channel. This is another one of my battles in miniature, and today we're going to be looking at Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill is near Boston, and Boston is famous for its place in American history. I've heard it's a nice place to stroll of an evening and take in some tea and some sort of party. Um, no, <laughs> seriously, at the onset of the Wars of Independence or Revolutionary War, Boston saw the first major actions. After Lexington and Concord, the British Army found itself besieged by the Continentals, and that was in April. Congress would eventually form the Continental Army, and George Washington would finally finish the siege of Boston. However, before that, it was under the command of Artemis Ward. Now, it was tough for both sides provisioning and organising their troops. For Britain, the Crown, it had 5,000 troops in Boston itself having to be supplied by the sea with limited scope for gaining supplies from nearby. For the Continentals, you suddenly had a lot of troops, 10,000, 20,000, due to the nature of the army foremen, which were militias, troops were there, troops weren't there. Um, it wasn't actually until towards the end of the siege when uh, after the fall of Fort Ticonderoga, the Continentals actually had enough artillery to properly conduct the siege. However, that is in the future. Boston, at the time, was sat surrounded by sea. Boston itself is on a peninsula with a net connecting it to the land. Now, in the north would be the Charleston Peninsula, which we're going to talk about today, to the south of Dorchester Heights. Britain had to do something about the siege. You just couldn't sit idly by, especially when it looked like the Continentals were going to start fortifying and having cannon in place on these heights overlooking Boston. That would interdict the sea transport and seriously limit Britain's ability to hold the city. So after the British had uh, deployed troops to Dorchester Heights, they looked north to Charleston. As we see, the river on one side, this will be representing the settlement of Charleston there in the distance. And behind Charleston would be another sort of sea. The Continentals had their eyes on this position that overlooked the sea lanes into Boston. But they also had spies within Boston and found out the British were intending to attack and take the position. That being the case... They sent troops under the command of William Prescott to start to defend and occupy Bunker Hill. Now, the hill that the, we have the redoubt on right now, this is actually Breed's Hill. Bunker Hill would be behind the main continental battle line at this point. Whether Prescott had decided this was a better position commanding the sort of peninsula it was on, or just got confused with hills, I'm unsure of at the moment. However, there they were the rebels. Now the British had two plans that they could have took. They could have taken the force and landed behind Bunker Hill, cutting a peninsula, by which time they would have uh, trapped some continentals at sort of Bunker Hill and Breed's Hill, and then faced off against the main army on the mainland. Or, land at the tip of the peninsula and an advance up capturing Bunker and Breed's Hill. Both were actually fairly audacious plans for the British because it would involve uh, naval landings and then an, a, an assault of either way uphill. Now traditional military theory is you need overwhelming numbers to carry an assault especially against prepared positions. During the, this battle, the British would never have the overwhelming numbers that I would have expected them to uh, embark on an assault. However, the British did have a lower opinion of the militia than the militia deserved. So we come to the battle as laid out before us. The British under General Howe is prepared to launch their first assault. So this battle is set up about 3 o'clock on June the 17th. So let's look at the Continental Command. In the main redoubt, we have Prescott. 
commanding various militias and he has 1200 men under his command constructed a redoubt and as you can see there redoubts uh, a dug emplacements often with logs uh, it's a fairly easy to construct defensive position they've spent around a day preparing it as the battle starts the british army actually starts transferring across the water in the morning and the the first assault isn't going to occur till three three o'clock so continentals have had much longer time to prepare in the face of a british assault coming down from the redoubt we have fenson eventually coming to a stone wall by the sea itself and here we see john stark and he would bring up 800 men famously advancing to the battlefield he would have to maneuver around about another thousand continentals that were were on the peninsula that didn't really take much part in the battle uh, another I forget which state uh, Stark was from and which state the Continentals were from. But uh, on his advance through, with all the opposing, well, other states' militia in front of him, he says, make way for if, let's say, Massachusetts won't, can't use the, won't use the roads, then the men of New Hampshire will. Something like that. Uh, shows the spirit of the man. I'll talk more about Stark later on. Now, like I say, so you've got about... 2,000 men actually from the Continentals defending what will be the main line against the British. You have about another 1,000 men milling around on the peninsula. Orders to dig in at Bunker Hill. However, they would not dig in at Bunker Hill. If they had, once Breed Hill had fallen, maybe the Continentals could have put up another stand at Bunker Hill. Uh, further out at Cambridge, there's the main army under the command of Artemis Ward. And again, there's upwards of 10,000 men there. But the nature of the Continental Army at this point is there is no great organisation above the sort of battalion level. Now, even though these are militia, and we tend to think of militia as being disorganised, and at times they were, however, the colonies had finished the French Indian Wars, and many men had fought in the French Indian Wars. There was a lot of experience on the continental side. And they knew militia and militia organization and the best way to construct and organize troops into a militia. Most importantly though, for example, officers like Stark, who would command the troops at this point, he had fought alongside the British regular army and knew what their tactics, what their organisation was, and we'll be able to start coming up with counter tactics for that. And ultimately, back then, life was different. Pretty much everybody had hunting rifles and stuff. So even though we talk about militia, there would still be some skill under arms. Put those militia in the right condition and would fight rather well. Put them in the wrong condition and they would struggle to stand up against redcoats. Speaking of redcoats, we spin around to the British forces under General Howe so General Howe was under General Gage General Gage was in command of Boston and hadn't moved over to take part in the battle we're about to see British Army was based around battalions each battalion was 10 companies 8 regular companies and 2 specialist companies and these specialist companies were grenadiers who were kind of more heavily assault based troops and light companies which were sort of independent able to independent minded men able to skirmish what we see deploying on the peninsula this day the charleston peninsula was seven battalions of regular troops and a couple of conjoined battalions so conjoined battalions british army would often take all the light companies all the grenadier companies put them together in an ad hoc command so they could operate as a grenadier battalion or a light battalion plus one and a half battalions of raw marines will be available with some artillery there would also be naval fire support from the fleet now the continental plan was simple hold stop the british advancing on and taking the hill british had, the british attack wouldn't be a simple advance up the hill and capture the redoubt 
what General Howe had planned was an attack to the flank. And this would be conducted by more light infantry, those got joint troops, grenadiers. And his hope was to outflank the redoubt. Capture this line here, outflank the redoubt as the main attack goes in. It was simple, or so we would see. So let us see the battle. Now I haven't covered all of this with the detritus of the battlefield you'd see. There was actually a lot of fencing, hedges. So when the British advanced, they were advancing through relatively difficult terrain. And the grass was high. So the British would start advancing and the light infantry would start advancing along the flank here. Now the British did have some artillery for covering supporting fire as you can see. The artillery was six pounder guns, they fired off their six pounder artillery and then real uh, cannons and then realized that their resupply was actually given 12 pounder guns. So the artillery support, support did not last long. There were continental guns available on the peninsula and there is some controversy about where they were deployed. Should they have gone further up? Should they have gone further back? But I'll let you look into that. Now here we have the first key part of the battle down at this picket fence. Stark had fought with the British regulars. British regulars would advance take the first volley off the enemy and then engage. So what Stark did was think about ways that he could create more pause in the British to stop them going straight in. What he did was organize his troops into three lines. And his plan was simple. The first line would fire, then retire back through the lines. The second rank would move up and fire. And the third and each rank fallen back behind the others to reload as the others went forward to maintain that line essentially creating more of a uh, rolling barrage of fire. So when the British advanced and took the first volley, and the first volley was always brutal, there were many casualties at that point. The British weren't expecting that second volley, that third volley, and keep going. Stark had also paced out 50 yards ahead and put some markers there so that when the initial volleys had gone and troops started independently firing, they knew exactly the optimum range for aiming. He'd also give his troops and Prescott's troops on the hill, more of in the two ticks, orders to aim at the belly button of a soldier so that if the shot went low, you might clip his legs and if the shot went high, hit his head or torso. There is uh, one of the myths of the battle is uh, wait till you see the light whites of their eyes before the Continental started firing. Uh, there's little evidence for that actually to have occurred, but certainly there is evidence that the Continentals knew when best to start and pause and fire. Now the attack up the hill into the main redoubt was terrible. British troops advanced and the British troops were shot to bits. They couldn't advance any further and the first assault faltered and the British troops were pushed back down the hill with large amounts of casualties. Continentals at this point had suffered few casualties being behind defence works as the British trying to engage them out in the open were torn to bits with a lack of cover. The first assault had failed. However, the British knew the importance of this battle. Couldn't allow the Continentals to win the first battle. So how reorganizes battalions and this time the second assault would go in. The second assault would actually see the British advance to a point and start to engage the Continentals in musketry. They weren't going to attempt to storm the redoubts or the fencing and engage at musketry. 
this is supposed to try and uh, cause some casualties amongst the Continentals and maybe force them to retire. What you, we would see is the Continentals again owning this battle. Um, any forces dug in behind fencing is going to have the advantage against troops lined up in the open. When I said earlier that if the militia are fighting the right battle, they will be brutally effective, this was the right battle for militia. Defending a position, uh, engaging in firepower with the British Army. If you have a sort of a, a militia made up of huntsmen or people are used to handling a rifle, then they're going to be pretty accurate. And the British Army would suffer a lot of casualties, but more importantly, a lot of casualties in the officer ranks, officer class. I think uh, there's about 92 British casualties. Now there is some controversy in the battle at this point, which is at Charleston. So Charleston would end up engulfed in flames. There's a couple of theories behind this, um, depending on what source and what bias you, you would read. First is that the British just burned the settlement with incendiary rounds. The second one was it was a British tracer fire that set the settlement alight. What we do know for sure was there were American sharpshooters there and the British obviously bombarded it and drove the Americans out. There's also talk that for the second assault, Howard asked for the village, uh, the town to be burned so the smoke could drift across the battlefield and provide his troops with some sort of cover. So the second assault has failed. The troops are pushed back. Casualties are starting to mount. The troops are tired. Now one of the things about the British advance so far had been to cross uneven ground up a hill. The troops were carrying packs and rations, three days worth of uh, rations, plus all the other equipment. It was heavy, hard going. It's also June, it's rather hot at this point. Howe's other brigade commanders wanted to give up at this point. They didn't want the battle to go on ahead. They didn't think they could win. As I said earlier, Howe knew the importance of this battle and, and, and needed a victory despite casualties mounting. What Howe got at this point was some more reinforcements. Uh, some battalions of raw marines. And regular troops. So it's about a battalion and a half of Royal Marines and another battalion of regular troops. How was ordered the troops to leave their packs? How knew the key to the battle would be the redoubt? So he would use an assault on the redoubt coming at different angles at different sides. So you see the, the troops over here, the plan would be simple now, up at the front, in at the side and push on against the fencing. Now the fencing wasn't, was always a diversionary attack uh, to ensure that the Continentals couldn't pull troops up to reinforce the redoubt. So it's at this point the third assault goes in. The light infantry are skirmishing against John Stark's troops at the boundary. And the main assaults are going in up the hill and flanking round at the side. It's hot work in the redoubt. And the day's expenditure of ammunition was starting to tell and the Continentals just didn't have enough ammunition to hold off this final assault which has been reinforced with extra troops. They also the attackers are moving quicker. So it's at this point that Prescott pulls back from the redoubt as the British start storming into the redoubt. The British are able to then pour fire onto the retreating Continentals, which is where most of the Continental casualties of this day will come from. There's about 70 troops killed at the Redoubt, uh, about 30 captured, and as the Redoubt fall, 
falls and the troops retreat and are shot down, there's about another 300 troops killed. Over at the picket fence, once the redoubt has gone, John Stark A knows that his command is redundant. There's no use protecting the flank of the redoubt when the redoubt has fallen. Uh, but also, if, the, if he stays where he is, he is going to be outflanked. So what his troops start doing is falling back in an ordered way. Um, some advancing, some turning back and shooting, vice versa. And he is able to retreat. And the rebels, rebels, continentals, I've been very careful not to call them rebels uh, throughout the whole battle. The continentals then actually fall back off the whole of the peninsula. Um, the British Army stop at Bunker Hill. There's a general rout of Continentals off, and the main Continental Army then is starting to form up at Cambridge. And the British do not have enough troops at this point to push on through to Cambridge. Their initial two and a half thousand troops, which have been deployed for the battle, the British have lost around a thousand, uh, about 300 dead, 700 wounded. Continental Casualties would be about half the British casualties. Uh, continental losses would equate to about 30% of the troops on the peninsula, whereas British losses would engage uh, would be about 40% of the troops on the peninsula. And when you consider the British had more troops, just barely, but more troops on the peninsula, it was a brutal, brutal victory for the British. Um, I forget the name of the person who said it, uh, when they were talking about the loss of continental troops at the battle, uh, which famously said a costly, a costly victory for the British, but I'd be happy to sell every hill in America to the British for such a price. And there we have it, the Battle of Bunker Hill, the first major set piece battle that was planned in the war. Lexington and Concord wasn't really a planned battle, and it the honours the field go to the British. But the honours and the performance of the Continentals will give them lots of hope for the wars to come. Hopefully you've enjoyed that and found it informative. I will be doing more battles in miniature in the future. If you've got any thoughts or comments or questions you'd like to share about Bunker Hill, then uh, do share that. I always look forward to chatting about that. And I look forward to talking to you in another video. That's bye for now. Goodbye.